This video is about improvements and modifications I've made to my 99 Kawasaki 800 Vulcan Classic. All of them involve the use of an Arduino microprocessor. If you've never played around with one of these microprocessors, it's easier and cheaper than you might think. The Arduino environment is open source, which means some other folks, almost always a lot better at this stuff than me, have published their code at places like GitHub. A good example here is the code I used to create my analog tachometer display. Using code I found on GitHub saved me a ton of work. A contributor by the name of Troy Barbour published a sketch, that's what an Arduino program is called, that he wrote to display the RPM of his CNC mill. I was able to copy his code and tweak it to fit my needs, saving me all kinds of time and learning and development work. There are three categories of improvements and modifications I address here. One, improvements to my roster cruise control installation. Two, auto canceling turn signals. And three, a single gauge mounted in the center of the handlebars that presents nine different types of information. There are many different flavors of Arduino microprocessors available. Here I use an Arduino Mega, plenty of memory and plenty of I.O. pins. So I'll start with explaining the modifications I made to my roster cruise control. I installed it several years ago, but was never all that happy with the way it worked. Way too much surging and harsh acceleration and deceleration. Another problem that I had was that it would randomly fail to engage. I found that about the only thing that would get it to work again was to come to complete stop, turn the motor off at the ignition switch, then fire it up again and go. Usually it would work again, for a while. I've never figured out why it does that, but using the Arduino I have reduced the occurrences of that happening, and even when it does I can usually reset it now by just cycling the ignition switch as I'm running down the road. So getting back to the surge problem. Originally, as you can see here, I connected the roster cable directly to the cable that I attached to the carburetor linkage. That was problem number one. I also mounted two magnets on the rear wheel. Problem number two. So I measured the travel of the carb cable, which is 11 sixteenths, and the travel of the roster cable, which is 1 and 5 eighths. I theorized that the roster was just having to work too hard and would easily overshoot the mark, resulting in the surging. So I cobbled up this linkage that takes full advantage of that 1 and 5 eighths inch roster cable travel. Because of this mechanical advantage, the resistance from the carburetor cable is now about 2.5 times less than it was, which, methinks, allows for much more precise adjustment by the rostra. Next, I theorized that the two magnets on the, rear, on the rear wheel were just not enough, so I epoxied seven magnets to the seven flat bolt heads that secure the front brake rotor to the hub. Also, while I'm no electronics expert, it seemed to me that a square wave is much more precise than a sine wave. So rather than use the coil supplied by Rostra, I decided to use a Hall effect sensor to send the pulses to the Rostra. So I picked up this Hall effect sensor. Conceptually, it's very simple. It requires five volts in ground, five volts in ground input. Then, as the magnets pass by the sensor, shown here at the bottom of the image, the sensor instantaneously switches the five volts on and off. But I couldn't very well mount that little sensor out in the weather, so I constructed a mold as shown, placed the sensor in it, then mixed up some polyurethane and poured it into the mold. When it cured, I removed it, cleaned it up, drilled a couple of mounting holes as shown. Then I turned a couple of standoff bushings and cobbled up an adapter plate and mounted it to the bolts that secure the brake caliper. I made all these modifications at the same time without testing after each one, so I don't really know how much to attribute the results of each update. But I do know this. My cruise control is now super smooth with absolutely no surge, very smooth engagement, acceleration and deceleration, and it holds the set speed up and down hills with almost no variation. Here's the Rostra dip switch settings I used. One last modification regarding the cruise control. I decided I wanted to have the controls for my modifications all within easy reach of my left hand without ever having to move it from its natural position on the left grip. Enter my switch plate, which is home to seven tactile switches. As you can see, the 
top two switches are for the cruise control set and resume functions, but look close. The roster is set up for set and coast on one switch and resume and excel on the other. I prefer set and excel to be combined as well as resume and coast. With the Arduino, no big deal. Here's how my Arduino is set up. Those five relays are, of course, controlled by the Arduino. The leftmost relay keeps the pulse wire from the Hall Effect sensor open. This makes the roster think the vehicle is not moving when it's not engaged. Remember, when it would fail to engage, I'd have to come to complete stop to get it working again. When I hit set or resume, the Arduino will latch that relay, wait one second, then latch the relay for set or resume. The second and third relays are for set and resume respectively, and the next two are for left and right turn signals. This is the code snippet for the set function. And this is the part of the snippet that sets the cruise control to the current speed if the roster is not currently engaged. This is the part of the snippet that kicks the speed up if the roster is currently engaged. Note that I command the resume function rather than the set function here. Okay, now on to the turn signals. Here you can see how the tactile switches are set up. I mentioned at the start that I added a self-canceling feature with the Arduino. Here's how that works. The unit shown here is a BNO055 inertial measurement unit. This little guy can report on all kinds of neat stuff, but all I was interested in is compass heading. It is amazingly accurate and seemingly unaffected by nearby electronics or anything else. I mounted it along with the Arduino in my left saddlebag. The auto cancel function requires two snippets of code. When one when the turn signal switch is hit to set the current compass heading, and another when the target number of degrees has been reached. In my case, I chose 30 degrees plus two more seconds. Here you can see the code required to set up for a left turn. And here you see the code required to perform the auto cancel once 30 degrees of turn have been reached. For those not familiar with the Kawasaki 800, other than, other than the speedometer, there are no gauges, just two idiot lights and a single turn signal indicator. I find that indicator to be out of my field of vision when normally running down the road, and I'm embarrassed to think of all the times I've left that darn turn, turn signal on well after the turn was made. So the one other modification I made to the turn signals was to make one for each side and move them up where they're a lot more visible. While they're self counseling now, there's always a possibility of leaving one on. I used 10 millimeter diffused amber LEDs for the turn signal as well as green 10 millimeter diffused LEDs for the cruise control. Okay, now on to the currently nine function display. I chose this OLED display unit and this instrument holder to mount it in. Then I cut out an adapter plate on my CNC router and installed it all as shown. These are the nine functions I currently am displaying. And here's a sample of what it looks like as I page through them all. Note that the two-digit numbers shown in the upper left on all displays is the number of satellites I'm currently fixed on. The last two tactile switches are used to page up or down through the displays. Following is a brief overview of how I made each display work. 
volts. If more than 5 volts are fed into an Arduino, you let the smoke out and you may as well just toss it. So how do you show 12 volts or 13 or 14 volts? Easy. You use a voltage divider coming in and a little math once in the Arduino. You basically reduce the 12 volts down to way past 5 volts and feed that voltage into an Arduino analog pin. Then in effect, reconstitute the voltage numeric value back up to where it was to begin with. Here's how. In my case, the voltage divider is a very simple one as shown. Note the values of resistors R1 and R2. As long as the input voltage is below around 35 volts, there's no chance of burning up the Arduino. Now, a digital microprocessor like an Arduino can handle analog voltages. So there's a converter in the Arduino that converts any voltage between 0 and 5 on an analog pin to an arbitrary number between 0 and 1023. Then it's up to the programmer to convert that arbitrary value into something meaningful. Now look at this code snippet. Note that R1 and R2 are assigned the known values of those two resistors, or in this case close. With that and a little math, the original voltage can be determined and displayed. Also note that the code you see here near the bottom is, not, is how you actually write stuff to the uh, OLED display unit. On to the uh, oil pressure display. I use this transducer I found on Amazon. If you're unfamiliar, conceptually a transducer is a very simple device. You use a constant voltage in like 5 volts and ground. Then a third wire, known as a signal, is sent out to the microprocessor. The voltage on this wire will be somewhere in between 0 and 5 volts, depending on how much pressure it senses. I had to calibrate it, so I hooked up my, the transducer to an air pressure gauge and a manual valve to my air compressor, then temporarily hooked up the transducer to my Arduino. I wrote a little code to simply display the current converted value, that 0 to 1023 for each increment of one pound and wrote down the pressure and the converted value. Then turned that data into this code. Then I had to do a little plumbing. Despite the fact that everything else in my bike is metric, the original idiot light sensor is regular old eighth pipe. So I picked up the T and the nipples shown and put it all together. Oddly, I had trouble with getting things to fit as some parts would only engage a thread or two before they got real tight. So I got out my eighth pipe, tap and die, and went to work. But eventually it all came together and fit quite nicely. Here it is, all mounted up. Next is the radiator temperature. I'm still doing some calibration tests, so instead of showing a heading of temp, I'm showing that value between 0 and 1023. This temperature sensitive sensor works pretty much like the oil pressure transducer. 5 volts and ground in, some variable voltage between 0 and 5 volts out to the Arduino. To make a home for it, I turned and drilled a plastic dowel, inserted the sensor so the sensor was flush with that hole you see, then turned it over and filled it with polyurethane. Then fashioned this adapter and secured it to the original horn mount bolts. Here's an example of the code used to convert that 0 to 1023 value to an actual temperature. The TAC was great fun to get working, but I never could have done it without a little help from a couple of internet contributors. Like a lot of us, I had heard or read about wrapping a wire around a spark plug lead to capture pulses, but I didn't have a clue as to how to actually do it. I found some references to it and even some schematics, but most of it was way beyond my pay grade. Then I thought, what about a do-it-yourself timing light someone has made? Why not start there? That's when I found Michael Forrest's blog where he did just that. He made his own timing light. He published this somewhat crude but very effective and understandable drawing. I figured I could duplicate what he did and instead of lighting up four LEDs, I could use that signal as input to a small simple electronic device known as an optocoupler as shown here. A pulse inputted on the left coming in 
lights up an infrared LED. Then a photo transistor reacts to the light and makes or breaks a connection between 3 and 4. 5 volts is connected to 4 and 3 is connected to the Arduino where the pulses can be counted. Here you can see how I wrapped a wire around the rear spark plug lead. And here you can see the board I cobbled together. Now I could count the pulses, but I didn't want to just have a digital readout for the TAC since the RPM is constantly changing and more difficult to read. I needed an analog display. When I looked at the environment required to do that, I was a bit overwhelmed. Back to a Google search, which turned up exactly what I needed. A guy by the name of Troy Barbour had coded an analog tachometer sketch for his CNC mill. His input and RPM range was different than mine, but with a little tweaking of my own, I was able to get everything working with not all that much effort at all. Okay, all that leaves now are the GPS functions I chose to display. Again, I show time, speed, elevation, heading, and distance I am from my home. Getting these values is incredibly simple using existing libraries that take all the grunt work out of the effort. Here's how it works. The GPS unit, once it is fixed on a few satellites, send a con sends a constant stream of what are called sentences. They look like that first line, but you don't even need to worry about that. The library functions that are available allow the user to simply call functions like the examples shown. They will return the actual value requested. Nothing more to it than that.